Today, we're going to cover Hebrew pronouns. Now, what is a pronoun? Okay, uh, in layman's terms, it's basically a word that points to a head noun. The antecedent is the noun to which a pronoun points. Okay, James, he hit the ball. He points back to James. Or if I say James's ball was kicked back to him. Him is the pronoun. The antecedent is James. Now in Hebrew, there's a lot of different pronouns. We have personal pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, relative pronouns, and we have interrogative pronouns. Basically, this lesson is a lesson in vocabulary. You need to learn your vocabulary. So get ready, make some flashcards. You will need it. So let's start with the basics, the independent personal pronouns. The way this works in Hebrew is you have masculine and you have feminine, but there's also common. The first person is common. Why? Because it's shared between masculine and feminine. Or in other words, there is no masculinity or femininity in the gender of these pronouns. Ani, I, Anochi, I. Either variant could be included. So know your vocabulary, be able to recognize both versions, but both mean I. Now in the second person, you can have masculine or you can have feminine. The second person masculine is ata, you. Second person feminine is a. Both mean you. One refers to a man, you man. One refers to you woman. Now in the third person, you can have masculine and feminine as well. And this one is kind of fun. It's it's Hebrew that has it who is he? And he is she. Who is he? And he is she. Third person masculine singular versus third person feminine singular. Who is he? And he is she. Now we also have plural. First common plural is anachnu. Anachnu. We. Now the second person masculine builds off of the singular in the plural. Instead of ata, we have Atem. Now that would be like you all, or as the Southerners have it, y'all. The feminine plural, second feminine plural is Atena. Atena. That would again be you plural. Now, because we're dealing with masculine and feminine, it'd be you all men or all you men. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but you get the idea. Or if it were feminine, all you women or you all women. Now the third masculine plural is heim or hema, which would mean they, meaning they men. For third feminine plural be hein or heina, they women. Now it's important to understand how to use these pronouns. Hebrew can have a verb. It could also not have a verb. And when you see the pronoun and no verb, you'll have to supply to be. Ani Adonai. There's no verb. So we supply to be. I am the Lord. Now we also have demonstrative pronouns. This, these, that, and also those. This, these, that, and those. This and these is the singular and plural in English. That and those, the singular and plural in English. Now Hebrew has their own versions. The masculine singular, ze. Feminine singular, zoet. Both of those mean this, but one is masculine, one is feminine. In the plural, masculine, instead of ze, we have ele, ele, these. Instead of the feminine zoet, this, we also have ele, these. 
in this case, the demonstrative pronoun is the same in the plural, whether it's masculine or feminine. Context will be key. Remember we said who is he and he is she? Well, that's when context shows it's the personal pronoun. But you can have who means that, he means that, when it's used as a demonstrative pronoun. And that's in the singular for masculine and feminine, respectively. So context, again, will be key. In the plural, it means those. And we've seen these before. Heim, heima, that's the masculine for those. Hain, heina, feminine for those. Now, when it comes to demonstratives, there are some variants. You don't need to memorize them. They're very infrequent, but you need to know that they're there. And they share similar features to what you have just learned. So you should be able to identify it, even though it's not going to be identical to what you've memorized. The idea is, can you recognize it? Can you play the detective and piece the clues together? Can you look at a word and say, that looks like this, but it's not quite right. Well, if you're doing that, you're asking all the right questions. You're looking at all the right things. Definitely look into it, investigate it. Now, demonstratives can act like adjectives. So for example, haish, haze, this man. It will follow the noun. It will match in gender, number, and definiteness, basically functioning like an attributive adjective. Relatively speaking, it will always follow the noun. So remember that you'll have a noun plus a demonstrative construction. When there is an adjective, present and modifying the head noun, then we'll have a sandwich. We'll have the head noun plus the adjective, and then last, we'll have the demonstrative pronoun. So if we were to say this good man, haish hatov haze, head noun plus adjective plus the demonstrative pronoun, haish hatov haze. We can also have uh, demonstrative pronouns. The location will be different. It will precede the noun. It will not match definiteness, but it will match in gender and number. This matches the predicative use of adjectives. Ze haish. This is the man. With the demonstrative pronoun, it will occur before the noun, acting like a predicative, predicative adjective you'll supply to be. The key is it will not match in definiteness. It will only match in the gender and number. Now, if there's a modifying adjective for the head noun, the only difference is instead of the demonstrative being last, it's going to go first. So it'll be demonstrative plus head noun plus adjective. So in our example here, ze haish hatov. This is the good man. Now, Hebrew has its own relative pronouns. In English, we have who, that, which, right? Relative clauses, okay? So Hebrew has the same. So remember what a relative clause is. It's the pronoun, the relative pronoun, plus whatever phrases that are attached to that clause. So happy is the man who, whose way is righteous. Who whose way is righteous. That is the relative clause in that sentence. So Hebrew uses a share, a share. There's no gender to it. There's no number to it. Context will be key. You'll translate it to that or which, depending on the context. Sometimes it's completely independent. It's its own word. Other times it will be joined to uh, a, a, a noun, word, phrase with a makef. For example, the king whom you serve, Hamelek Asher Bechartem, the king whom you serve. So when you're coming across relative pronouns, it can be helpful to put in parentheses with a pencil your relative clause, figure out where it begins, figure out where it ends, because it kind of stands apart from the rest of the sentence. Now, Hebrew also has interrogative pronouns, questions, words with built-in questions, okay? Now, context will determine whether you include that question mark or not. There are several to memorize. Me. Who? 
So I like to remember that one by who? Me? Who? Me. Hebrew, me. English, who? Okay, but it's a question. Me? Ma means what? The way I like to remember that is what, ma? Ma, what? They can appear separate. They can appear joined with a makef. There are some variations on ma, meaning what? But you get the idea. Main plus he. Those are your main consonants. Sometimes it'll have the dogish forte, sometimes it won't. But again, me, mem plus he. So here's an example with a makef. Ma shamo. What is his name? Now, in this case, we have to supply to be because there's no verb. Here's an example without the makef. Mi ha'anashim ha'ele. Who are these men? And lastly, we have the interrogative particle. It's a he with a ha hatef pathak. And when it's put at the front of a word, you know there's a question mark. It will prefix the first word of that sentence, and you might need to add some helping words to communicate the idea of the question. So, for example, without a question, if we were to say, Shalach Hamelech et Navi, the king sent the prophet. If we add the interrogative particle, now we'll say, Hashalach Hamelech et Navi. Did the king send the prophet? So one is a simple statement. The other is a question. Remember, Hebrew is not English, so it's not going to have the question mark at the end of the sentence. This is how they form. In some ways, they form questions. Now, sometimes you'll see the hey tagged on, but it won't have the hatef pathak. Instead, it'll just be a pathak. Other times, it'll just be a segol. But you'll notice something's a little weird. Don't confuse it with the definite article. The definite article, which is the pathak, is followed by what? Dagesh, Dagesh Forte. Sometimes the particle will actually attach to a verb and then it's a dead giveaway. It's not the definite article. There are more interrogative pronouns than was covered uh, in the main portion of the chapter. So you'll need to learn these as well. Lama, why? Or it could be Lama, why? Ech, ek, or echa, how? E or aye, where. So add those to your vocabulary, get your flashcards going, and you'll have all these pronouns ready to go in no time. Hope you found this chapter helpful. It's pretty straightforward. Learn the vocabulary. You got this. Not a big deal. Next week, we'll cover pronominal suffixes, where we can add a suffix to the end of a word to show pronouns. Pronominal suffix. That's what it means. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments, what questions do you have? We've gone over eight different uh, weeks so far of lectures. What questions do you have? What do you need me to answer? Maybe I have an answer. Maybe I don't. But let me know in the comments below. If you haven't already, subscribe, like the video, follow me on WordPress. And we'll see you on the line. See you next week. Bye-bye.